Welcome to The Least You Should Know. Boy, aren't you glad you're here now. Listen, after we slogged through the Puritan period of the 17th century with that excruciating anxiety they had about their salvation, and then we made it through the Enlightenment, the 18th century, that, that uh, zeal for logic uh, and rational uh, inquiry. Now we get to the Romantics, the beginning of the 19th century, and just like that, a balm of soothing spring air comes wafting through the pages up to us. We're getting ready for some really good stuff. This is American literature for me uh, at its finest. Uh, the first half of the 19th century is considered by many to be one of the richest uh, most productive periods in American literature. Today we're going to look at uh, the dates of the American Romantic period. We're going to look at some reasons why the movement um, appeared when it did, and we're going to look at some of the uh, characteristics of American Romanticism. So I'm glad you're still with us. I'm glad that uh, our Puritan friends are in the past. Uh, that our Benjamin Franklins and Thomas Paines are in the rearview mirror and looking forward to some fine, fine uh, uh, experiences with, uh, with the American Romantics. Well, broadly speaking, most literary historians look at American Romanticism as a period that marked the first half of the 19th century. <clears throat> now, more specifically, we could take a look at the publication of several works that contain or express what becomes known as a romantic aesthetic or a romantic sensibility. So we might, for example, look at William Cullen Bryant's uh, poem Thanatopsis, which we will read and study together, which was published in 1817. Or we might look at Washington Irving's The Sketchbook, which contains those um, famous early tales like Rip Van Winkle and the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Or we might point to James Fenimore Cooper's publication of The Pioneers in 1823. As we've seen though, the romantic vision operates earlier in works. For example, if you remember Philip Freneau's poem, The Wild Honeysuckle, there was an expression of romanticism in it, in its um, a keen sort of observation of the natural world and its ability to communicate some sort of human truth to the reader. The beginning year of most literary movements is difficult to establish, right? I mean, it's not as though American writers woke up one morning, you know, on January 1st, you know, uh, 1800 and said, uh, from this point forward, uh, we will be uh, we will call ourselves romantics uh, up until the Civil War. So uh, the beginning is, is oftentimes hard to pin down as we've seen. Some could say as the early as the 1800 and as late as 1830. That said, we can, uh, I think, more definitively sort of find the, uh, the end date for American Romanticism. So most would agree that uh, the Civil War marks the closing of American Romanticism as a literary movement. So we could point to the beginning of the Civil War, 1861, or the end of the Civil War, 1865, as the conclusion of the peak period of American Romanticism. That said, we can still identify strains of Romanticism uh, in the early realist period that comes after the Civil War. And we could certainly make an argument that uh, in contemporary popular culture and literature, we still see that aesthetic sensibility uh, come through in a variety of, uh, of works, uh, poems. Uh, Mary Oliver comes to mind. Um, certainly novels, uh, television shows, and, uh, and movies. I think that one rise for the development of American Romanticism was that erosion of um, 
the Puritan culture that we saw that uh, d so dominated um, the 17th century, uh, which gave way to the Enlightenment in the 18th century, and the deists, as we saw expressed through the creeds of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, uh, and so many of those other founding fathers. At the beginning of the 19th century, particularly in New England, we see the rise of the Unitarian denomination, which uh, rejects um, the premise of the Holy Trinity, uh, and instead asserting that God exists in one being. Some of the characteristics of Unitarianism uh, involve reason and conscience, so still uh, some shadings of the Enlightenment there, right? Religious tolerance, uh, freedom of religious beliefs, uh, and, and this point too, uh, a faith in the universal brotherhood of mankind. Some additional reasons for the development of Romanticism uh, can be traced again back to the, this decline of the Puritan uh, stronghold. Got to remember the Puritans did not really encourage literary forms like the novel the, or, or drama or even secular poetry. Literary imagination, uh, fiction in the way that we think about it today was discouraged by the religious orthodoxy and dogma of that era. So when Puritanism declined as a cultural power, it no longer held a tight rein on the imagination of New England, uh, which came to dominate American literature throughout the 19th century. That Again, that first half of that 19th century in American literature, we begin to uh, encounter literature that is uh, written uh, and produced and consumed for pleasure. Uh, and this really does mark, I think, a significant contrast from the previous periods, the Enlightenment uh, and the Puritan era. It's important for us to note, though, that Romanticism as a sensibility was already underway in Europe and England. And you have to remember that American writers, and most writers, we could say broadly speaking, are readers first and foremost. And so American writers were influenced by the French, the German, and the English Romantics. People like Rousseau, William Wordsworth, William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Thomas Carlyle, Shelley, Keats, etc., etc. And so we see a generation of American writers who are responding to the Enlightenment rationalism and the neoclassicism of the previous age. But let's look at the fifth reason for its development because I think this is, I think it's chief among the ten that we'll look at today. We must remember that there was a rise of political nationalism there in the generation or two after the American Revolution. So, um, and part of this, um, uh, a part of this nationalism was a palpable desire for a cultural nationalism. Or, if we say it another way, the political maturity that Americans were beginning to feel and that American identity that they began to feel and the greatness that America felt at this period demanded a corresponding imaginative maturity and greatness. We had declared ourselves politically independent from our English ancestors, yet we were still, up until this point, culturally dependent on them with respect to literary traditions and conventions. There's a wonderful quote by James Russell Lowell, who was um, one of the uh, fireside poets or the schoolroom poets of this era, and he writes about Ralph Waldo Emerson, who we will study uh, later in this unit. And Lowell wrote, until Emerson came, American authors had little independence. Quote, we were socially and intellectually bound to English thought until Emerson cut the cable and gave us a chance at the dangers and the glories of blue waters. He was our first optimistic writer. Before his day, Puritan theology had seen in man only a vile nature and considered his instincts for beauty and pleasure 
proofs of his total depravity. Let me read that last part again. Before his day, he's talking about Emerson, but by extension, this Romantic era. Puritan theology had seen in man only a vile nature and considered his instincts for beauty and pleasure proofs of his total depravity. So this instinct that human beings have for beauty and pleasure is certainly uh, recognizable in this American Romantic period. I think I may have misspoke on the last slide, suggesting that we would look at 10 reasons for its development. Uh, there are only five that I've listed. We're going to look at 10 characteristics of American Romanticism. And number one is that with Romantic works, uh, we often detect a sense of wonder that uh, infuses Romantic works. The Romantic will see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Everything is meaningful, alive, interconnected, so that the universe can reveal itself in something as seemingly ordinary as a drop of water for Emerson or a blade of grass to Whitman. This attitude inspires romantic works with an emotional vitality. Number two, the romantics favor the emotions, intuition, and imagination over the intellect, scientific, and rational. They can be at times, indeed, anti-intellectual. Again, consider Emerson's statement in his essay, The American Scholar. Quote, books are for the scholar's idle times. When he can read God directly in nature, the hour is too precious to be wasted in other men's transcriptions of their readings. The Romantics believe in the potentiality of all things. They believe that human beings are inherently, innately good, and if left alone and unspoiled by the institutions of society, can achieve great things. They can often be anti-authoritarian uh, and anti-institution. Those institutions of society, like government, like um, education, uh, oftentimes organized religion, in some romantic works, we will see um, the untutored and those most remote from civilization, like young children uh, and Native Americans, often idealized in romantic works because they have yet to feel the corrupting mechanisms of civilization. So the romantics have a faith in the directing resource of a subconscious inner life. They value the individual's intuition, and the individual's intuition um, is always a, uh, a more privileged and a, um, uh, a more significant guiding force than one's intellect. For the most part, American Romanticism is an optimistic aesthetic, which is why for me it's so invigorating. Now that said, there is something known as dark Romanticism, and so let's pause here for a second and uh, think about uh, uh, what I mean by this, uh, or what historians and literary historians mean by this. If we think about writers uh, and, and of these three, you may be the most familiar with maybe Edgar Allan Poe, but also Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, and Herman Melville. If you think about uh, their fiction and, and their aesthetic sort of sensibility, the prism through which they view the human condition, you will see the, there, there's a dark sort of gothic uh, shading uh, to their stories. These are still considered romantic, um, but we would classify them as a dark romantic as opposed to a light romantic. Your light romantics are going to be, you know, the Fountainhead, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, but your Henry David Thoreau's, um, your Margaret Fuller's, um, your Washington Irving's, uh, Fenimore Cooper, etc. Romantics have a healthy contempt for the past, and particular the traditions of the past, that sort of inherited knowledge. They disdain convention. 
They were looking for new approaches to life, and they refused to be restricted by the traditions and wisdom of the past. As Emerson reminds his audience in The American Scholar, quote, each age must write its own books. The books of an older will not fit his. Meek young men grow up in libraries, believing it their duty to the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Locke and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote these. And if you consider Henry David Thoreau, who is um, uh, uh, certainly a favorite of mine, think about his Walden based on his experience of going to the woods and living there for two years, two months, and two days in a cabin that he built with his own hands. He writes, in any weather, at any hour of the day or night, I have been anxious to improve the nick of time and notch it on my stick, too, to stand on the meeting of the two eternities, the past and the future, which is precisely the present moment to toe that line. So these were individuals who embraced life. They had a gusto for the present and for the manifestation of the individual's divine nature, for their creativity, for their intuition, for their emotions in the present. Uh, without any respect at all for what came in the past, what a previous generation would argue is conventional wisdom uh, uh, or traditionally held as being acceptable or appropriate behavior. That's why I love them. They were radicals. The romantics and especially the transcendentalists were reformers. They were radicals. They were individuals of action. John Brown was a hero to Thoreau, Emerson, and Melville. Margaret Fuller wanted first to live and not to write. Thoreau emphasized the importance of doing, of living, right? My life has been the poem that I would have writ but I could not both live and utter it, right? So this impulse for reform, the belief in individual worth, back to that first characteristic, right, the potentiality of all things, this inspired romantics to become involved, really, particularly the transcendentalists, in the two principal social issues of their day, the abolitionist movement, anti-slavery, and the women's rights movement. The Romantics express a deep and abiding love of nature and the natural world, which they perceive always as a source of wisdom, a source of guidance, consolation, and happiness. This notion that nature provides a balm and can restore and regenerate the individual is a chief, chief characteristic of the American Romanticism period. This picture here, this painting, is called Kindred Spirits by Asher Brown Durand, and it depicts the poet William Cullen Bryant and the painter Thomas Cole against a background typical of the Hudson River School of Painters and of some in the literary works of Bryant, Irving, and Cooper. Romantic literature, particularly American Romanticism, it can be adventurous, at times boyish. Uh, as Leslie Fiedler points out in his great study, Love and Death and the American Novel, American fiction of the period features exotic stories of life among cannibals, gothic horror tales, Indian fights, and struggles out west. And certainly, American Romanticism can be a symbolic literature. We see symbolism operating in the works of Poe, Hawthorne, Melville, and so many others. Poe, for instance, uses symbols to reveal the often dark recesses of a character's psyche, like in his tale, uh, The Fall of the House of Usher. I know you're familiar with Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, right? That's a symbolic um, novel as well, really the nation's first fully symbolic novel. Uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick is a symbolic literature as well. Can Romanticism uh, 
the authors of this era are far more subjective, openly personal, and autobiographical uh, in their work. If you consider the opening line of Walt Whitman's famous poem, Song of Myself, I celebrate myself. So this marks sort of a radical departure from the previous eras. Uh, I guess you can make an argument that some of that Puritan poetry uh, is autobiographical, um, but it's a, um, you know, it's always tinged, isn't it, and, and sort of shaded by that sort of angst about um, uh, about that, their spiritual salvation. And so we see in the 19th century romantic poet uh, just a far more openness uh, and far more subjective inwardness uh, with their poetry, at least in Dickinson and Whitman. I mean, they're really only the principal main poets of the 19th century. Everybody else was just a derivative and um, you know, writing in the traditions of, uh, of English poetry, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there later. American Romantics were intensely nationalistic. They called for really the development and support for a native literature, for a literature that was uniquely American, arguing and believing vehemently that a new unique country should have a new unique literature. And this was a very conscious decision held and um, uh, believed by many. They strove to, the, to develop m more organic forms uh, as, um, that would complement the new country. We see them beginning to root their stories in the American landscape, in American places, in American traditions, and American customs. Uh, we think about certainly Thoreau and certainly all of uh, Whitman's poetry. And just a side note, this is an interesting point to me and maybe to you as well, considering this characteristic. It helps explain, I think, why Edgar Allan Poe uh, was uh, held in contempt by so many New England writers. Because if you think about the fiction of Poe, there's really nothing that's uniquely American about it. In fact, when you open up an Edgar Allan Poe story and begin reading it, it really has a European sort of, the, the stories often have a con European continental sort of flavor to them, right? They're tucked away in some strange exotic Gothic uh, realm, but there's nothing really American really about, uh, that signals to the reader, aha, this is an American uh, voice that I'm reading here. And that was a conscious decision by Poe, but it, it left him in sort of bad, uh, bad stead with the movers and shakers of the uh, literary uh, Luminati, you know, of New England and Boston and so forth. Um, so at the heart of American Romanticism is transcendentalism, which we will get to when we get to Ralph Waldo Emerson, the big E. I'm so excited, I can hardly even contain myself. I'm quaking with anticipation. Listen, I've done my best to keep these tapes to about 20 minutes, these videos. Uh, I'm sorry I went over a little bit uh, today. Well, honestly, most days I do. Uh, but I have great faith in you, and I know, I believe in my heart and soul that you've already discovered the video playback speed in YouTube, and you've bumped me up to about 1.5 or 1.75 or 2.0 or 2.5. Anyway, uh, I had a good time today. I hope you did too. I hope you're enjoying the class. Let me know if there's anything that I can do for you. That's why I'm here. Bye.